All right. Can everybody hear me all right? There's sure a lot of you up there. Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I didn't realize all that was yours. I thought there was a free uh, phone charger up here, so I was going to get my phone charged while, uh, while I talk. I have uh, one of the dying batteries on a iPhone, so I get like, uh, I can, it's like when you floor the gas pedal on an old 60s muscle car, you can just sort of watch the fuel tank drain. All right, we'll get started here. My name's uh, Eric Sorensen. I'm uh, at Apuk online and Eric at Public Com at work. And I should uh, have a little bit of a disclaimer in that um, there's a, uh, you know, while I, uh, I'm going to talk about the history of configuration management, and I have a particular uh, point of view on this sort of stuff. I've, I've been doing it for a really long time, uh, but I have been doing product management at Puppet for the last uh, six years. Prior to that, I was a systems administrator, uh, a SRE, an accidental developer sometimes. Um, so I'm sure that. Uh, my version of history may differ from yours. The taxonomies and the evolution and the, thing, the tools I choose to focus on may not include uh, something that you care passionately about, which is fine. We all have our own kind of uh, opinion of events. My, uh, I'm happy to talk about uh, anything that I got wrong over, uh, over beers tonight and uh, over the next few days. So, uh, But yeah, just include a disclaimer here. Um, this is me up in my natural habitat up in Portland, Oregon. I like playing electronic music with synthesizers and drum machines. And uh, just like when you get a lot of retweets, I get to throw up my SoundCloud here. Um, I've been involved in this community for a really long time. My first CF Engine deployment was on version 1.5 back in uh, 1998, which is nearly 20 years ago now, which is terrifying. It was before I lost all my hair. Um, I'm not implying any causation there, but there might be some <laughs> involved. Uh, I've implemented some large-scale infrastructures over that time, from compute farms for semiconductor manufacturers up to cloud services for mobile devices that uh, start with the letter I. And I've been involved with Puppet uh, in some way or another for over a decade now as a user and a contributor, and uh, more, more recently as kind of the... I guess the curator or steward of the, of the prod product and the project. So this talk is, uh, as Chris mentioned at the beginning, an updated version of a talk I gave at the config management camp that was in Portland a couple of years ago. Was anyone else there besides James and, uh, and Chris? It, and Toshan? Uh, cool, so no, it's all, it'll all be fresh and new for you. Um, I hope you'll forgive any of the repeated parts, but uh, things have definitely advanced since mid-2017 when that uh, conference happened. In fact, about the only thing that has remained the same is that there's been a lot of change. And I still love dad jokes, so I can't help it. There's some, ki <laughs> there's some types of change that are really good. Uh, you can play pinball with lots of small change. Uh, if there's an awesome pinball bar here in Ghent, which is an uh, incredible development. It wasn't here five years ago. But uh, I'll be down at the Comic Sans bar, and if you want to challenge me to Theater of Magic, oh, it's, it's on. Um, we'll play until we run out of change. There are some kinds of change which are bad, however. Uh, this is like climate change that floods half the world and parches the other half. This, is from, this photo is from South Carolina on the eastern part of the United States seaboard, but it could be from Asia or from Europe or any coastal area around the globe. And I firmly believe personally that climate change is the biggest problem that we need to solve as a global civilization. I just read a study from Cornell University that says that 1.4 billion people are going to need to relocate from where they live to escape rising seas by 2060 if we don't take drastic action now. If there's anyone who doubts that there's some unprecedented and deeply troubling change go on, going on, I have some oceanfront property in the Netherlands that I'd like to sell you. <laughs> there will be soon. Um, if you're not convinced, you can uh, Google for an article called The Uninhabitable Earth and prepare not to sleep for about a week. 
So I'm, I'm, um, I'm really interested to talk to anyone here that's working kind of at this intersection of cloud computing, big data, and climate science. I think we, as an industry, are in a unique position to apply some massive computational power to understand and to fight back against this, but it's got to take a coordinated effort at a massive scale. And so if anybody's working in this area, please come and talk to me. I'm really uh, keen to, to hear about it. So in my previous talk, I had asserted that the change that configuration management was undergoing was transformative change, uh, like a step function, like a butterfly that comes out of a chrysalis which a caterpillar had created. And nearly two years on, I'm not quite prepared to say that was completely wrong. There's definitely some changes that feel fundamentally different from what came before. So not provisioning uh, metal or even VMs because you're running everything on cloud services and you talk only APIs. That's quite a different approach than um, hand tooling pixie boot configurations. But uh, it's perhaps more useful, uh, and in any case it serves the goal of the talk better, to talk about things in terms of evolutionary change. Evolution is something that happens slowly over long periods of time, like the last two decades. Uh, it's a relative eternity in computer time. And each stage builds on what came before. There's also some really interesting edge cases that happen in evolution, like in the example you see here of uh, placental mammals and marsupials that evolved to look very similar because they evolved in similar ecological niches but they share very little common ancestry because um, the marsupials tend to evolve in Australia. Because of its geographic isolation, Australia is a hotspot for this kind of evolution. The Australian animals carry their babies in a pouch, and, but, but they look, uh, again, quite similar to um, uh, the way that um, uh, the, the placental mammals look. There we go. I wrote too many notes here, so I have to scroll on them. Um, uh, so they, they adapted perfectly to the environment. In some cases, they're actually superior to the, uh, to the um, placental counterparts. Um, and at this point, I should, probably give, I should probably pause and give thanks to uh, folks like James Turnbull and Jez Humble and Lindsay Homewood and uh, my coworker, Nigel Kirsten, who have also advanced the state of our field despite their relative geographic isolation and being from Australia. Um, <laughs> because their, their environments, you know, they end up adapting in, in similar ways, as I said. Um, if you, it, for example, if you end up in an environment where the main protein source is ants, you tend to evolve in a way that allows you to get the ants out of their nest better, and you get along, uh, you know, over time, the, the uh, animals which uh, have a longer snout are able to get ants more readily than ones that don't, and that uh, evolutionary pressure over uh, tens of thousands of years re re results in these uh, crazy-looking anteaters and the Australian numbat. Um, so in config management, you might think of this like, we're solving the same problem, and two projects might land with the same kind of approach, even if they don't have any code in common, they don't share any, any DNA. So with that as a backdrop, let me talk about the four generations that I think that we've undergone. And again, uh, these are my, this is my taxonomy and my, my roles. We can, we can argue about uh, the meaning of, of words and whether I've got the things right. Uh, happy to do that until, uh, but, but not during the talk, please. Just wait until afterwards. Um, so the first one is kind of the primordial soup. This is a biologist term for the state of Earth's organic matter, uh, the initial soup from, all, from which all subsequent life forms descended. Some refinement, so some life forms evolve from that, uh, emerge from that soup and it started adapting to their environments. And specialization, we had some uh, increasing adaptability to cover more and more specific niches, sort of like those ant eaters that I was just talking about. And then synthesis, which I think is the stage that we're currently in, that's characterized by a recombination of previous forms and new advances as well. And after that, well, we'll see. How about before that? If I'm completely honest here, uh, I think things should be indexed with zero. All lists should begin with zero. Uh, and yeah, so cheers from the array, the array fans in the crowd. Um, uh, 
<laughs> I should acknowledge there was something that, was, that existed before there was this discipline or this thing was actually called configuration management. People were doing configuration management. They just didn't call it that. We called it systems administration. If you got a new machine in and it needed to be set up correctly or you wanted to duplicate something that you'd done before, you just used what? Shell commands. Shell commands are awesome. Um, and this is sort of the world that, that existed at the time. These are from the, uh, the GeoCities cage at an Exodus colo facility in May 1999. I found these on the net courtesy of somebody named Mike Stevens who used his potato quality phone back then and somehow preserved those images over, over the time. Um, there's a ton of Sun Ultra 2s. Uh, I, I worked in, the, I think, this exact data center, although I had a different, different cage down the, down the row there. And uh, some uh, JBOD disks. There's maybe some early net apps, the kind with the, the Chrome fronts on them. Those things were pretty awesome. And occasionally, you'd get a really big server in, like one of these. Uh, Sun. Well, this was like the hot shit, right? And I, you, you maybe get like one or two of these uh, in a year, and you'd have to set it up as a systems administrator. And uh, you know, uh, oh, I guess I should say too. Sometimes you would get one of these that had uh, these 450 megahertz CPUs that had a, a horrendous manufacturing bug that caused them to crash all the time. Anybody else remember that? It was called the is in the e-caches. Yeah, those were terrible. You spent like a lot of time in the data center at you know, three and four in the morning replacing these CPU boards that failed for no, uh, no visible reason. But when one of the systems came in, you just use, you know, you'd use shell. You'd either have some stuff saved. Maybe there was some uh, a collection of, uh, of scripts that you had in a shared directory. If you were really on the cutting edge, you would use revision control like RCS. And if you did something wrong, you could dig it back out of RCS. If things went really wrong, you could go back to the DLT tapes and try to restore things. Like it's, it was not a fun time. Like, let's be honest, it wasn't great. Um, there were some folks who looked at the state of this and looked a little bit further ahead and thought, you know, number one, this isn't, we can do better than this. But number two, that there were changes coming and that we needed to uh, we needed to change how, our, how we worked on things in order to, um, to, to, to apply some science to the problem. So that evolved, that leads to our first stage in evolution. And we can oh. enter CF Engine. This is one of uh, a few screen grabs that I'll show. This came from the, uh, the Internet Archive or the Wayback Machine. This was uh, CF Engine's homepage in 1998. Um, and uh, yeah, shout out to the Internet Archive too. For the folks at archive.org do a tremendous job of saving uh, ephemeral, uh, you know, things that we think are going to be forever, but actually, uh, you know, even three or four years later, like you can't run a shockwave site anymore. That's probably for the best, but <laughs> but uh, we we need them. Uh, they're doing good work. CF Engine was amazing. If you were willing to invest the time, you could make your infrastructure do things that seemed impossible uh, pre previously. Uh, just the other day, uh, as a little bit of a digression, Mark Burgess tweeted this out, that he's, uh, no one wants the kind of work I do. Um, he wasn't trolling or fishing for compliments either. He said uh, a couple of days later that uh, he was having a really down day and he really was you know, kind of racked with um, self-doubt about what he was working on. Uh, and he didn't expect the outpouring of sentiment that came out uh, in the responses to his tweets. I think I know there's a few folks here that, that replied to this, um, and I, I think that this audience of any of the world is kind of the beneficiary of what Mark has done and continues to do. Uh, he's not here this year, but uh, for the benefit of posterity on live, can we give Mark Burgess a round of applause? I appreciate him. I know I personally, I wouldn't be standing on this uh, podium if I didn't start down this path with CF Engine back in, way back in 1998. Um, here's a post from Luke Keniz on the Infrastructures mailing list, infrastructures.org. I saw Steve Trogitz here, which is awesome. Uh, Steve started uh, what, this website and mailing list uh, called Infrastructures. And uh, the community and the discussions that sprang up around that was a key space where people were talking about these kinds of things back in the early 2000s. 
You can tell this is really old because it's in Courier. The early 2000s were a weird time in configuration management. At the time, the concept of repeatable convergent automation tools was pretty edgy, and the community was pretty edgy too. I think, um, you know, I met Mark at one of the um, config management boffs at Lisa, and I, I think I told him he ruined my life, <laughs> but he also saved my life too. So it's, you, get a, you gotta have both, both things. Um, Luke was mostly working on a tool that uh, he and uh, Steve uh, worked, worked through, as Steve's originally, is called ISConf. And um, there's, uh, Luke for eventually forked ISConf and wrote much of it in Perl, and it was originally written in Make, and then integrated with CF Engine. Then I think Steve rewrote it again in Python, and I'm not sure what happened after that. But the, in this post, there's a hint that it's, not, uh, it's, it's all not sitting well with ISConf. Like, uh, there's uh, some, uh, you, it, it, because of its make-based uh, uh, interaction model, it, it was not the friendliest thing in the world. And um, yeah, Luke, in his characteristic way, is like, this drives me absolutely insane. Uh, and he's, there's some hint here that I'm either going to make some significant changes to CF Engine or, hint, hint, maybe write something from scratch that implements CF Engine-like behavior. And this is kind of the world that Puppet was born into. Next phase in the refinement stage. Uh, again, Mark uh, and uh, Alva Couch, they brought this a lot of science and, and rigor and method, methodological rigor to this idea of uh, config management tools. There's also some uh, fairly hilarious things um, in this uh, paper. You can look up the, the whole thing. It's, it was, a, uh, for, I think, from 2006. Um, he says, uh, it, each tool has a faithful adherence whose dedication borders on religious fervor. Does that feel familiar to anyone? I don't, I don't know. Um, and uh, also, amusingly, uh, this comment that um, people seem to continue to need to reinvent the wheel and write completely new things from scratch. I think that probably hasn't changed in the last uh, decade plus, as we'll see. And uh, this uh, amusing footnote at the config management boff, uh, people using other authors' config management tools, except for the CF Engine community, everyone had written tools, and the only user of each tool was its own author. Probably not the best uh, way to get a widespread adoption and tooling. Um, Puppet uh, started out, uh, you know, sort of at, at, in this, in, at this time, and this is a photo from the first Puppet camp in San Francisco in 2009. There's Luke at the podium and uh, some folks that are still here today. Um, this people were taking these ideas and putting them in practice in, in the real world at Google, at Apple, at Red Hat, at CERN. And there's probably no greater uh, predict, predict, predictor of eventually working at Puppet than having been in this room in 2009. Some of us have moved on, some are still around. I'm, I'm still bald. It's, I, uh, no, I have Ari in there. Oh, maybe this, he didn't have a label, but yeah, that's Ari uh, right below the word good. Um, and there's Ben Hughes with his pink hair, obviously. But uh, the community was growing, and people latched on to Puppet's approach. Modules had provided this idea of reusability, so we no longer had to write our own tools to do it. It was easy to get started, and growth exploded. It kind of found this viral loop of discover, use it, and get some value, and share. There was also some, uh, yeah, some schisms uh, in, two, in the community in 2009. Um, uh, Adam Jacob split off and made Chef. And if you want to revisit some drama, there's an amazing post on Chris's blog from this called um, Is Anyone Else Confused About Chef? Uh, and the comments there have, you know, it's just a, a, a rogues gallery of uh, crazy people ranting at one another. It's, it's, it's some good, good reading. Um, this page is from the very first Chef website that's also courtesy of the Wave, Wayback Machine. It's kind of an encapsulation of why uh, Chef was written in the first place. There's a couple of very sort of distinct fundamental um, philosophical differences that, uh, uh, that separate Puppet from Chef. Uses Ruby directly. I mean, there's a DSL, but it's a thin layer. You're still writing Ruby, and you can ignore the DSL completely and just write Chef in pure Ruby if you wanted to. Um, and uh, the, at the time, Puppet had a uh, extraordinarily 
um, bad idea of shuffling the order in which resources were run as a form of deliberate obfuscation. Um, it was like, yeah, maximal user hostility, I think. Um, it was intentional? Yeah. Yeah, it was a deliberate... Yeah, so you, you wanted, we wanted to, they, that was pre, pre me and it's been fixed. I should, but does anyone still think that Puppet works that way? I think that there are some perceptions that people have that were formed in like 2011 and just haven't changed. Um, no, but, uh, it hasn't been that way since like 2013 or something like that. It does, deli it does deliberate top down ordering, uh, certainly since Puppet 4. Um, but yeah, it was a choice to make you for, to force people to declare dependencies if they wanted things to happen in a particular order. Um, so I lost my spot. We'll keep going. Generation three specialization. Um, Ansible came up in 2013, and Mike. Dahan had written Cobbler and Funk. He worked at Puppet for a little bit and went back to Red Hat, um, started Ansible Works, a company around it, which renamed to Ansible, and then they got absorbed back into Red Hat, so it's like the cycle of life continues. That's sort of another evolutionary step, I guess, that evolutionary phase. But um, Ansible was, I am not, you know, I, I, it's not too much to say at all that it was pretty revolutionary when it came out. It was a, um, by focusing on radically simplified automation and getting as much of the ceremony and ritual and stuff that you needed to do in the previous tools out of the way of the user and letting you focus on getting stuff done uh, with a minimum amount of fuss, I think that was, was truly revolutionary. Um, this emergence of uh, this, this third generation is largely a, a byproduct of Ansible's uh, massive effect on the industry. And I think that the, um, you know, the, the growth of the community here, this is from uh, Donnie's talk uh, back in 2015, uh, that shows the uh, relative uh, popularity in the um, in the communities, as well as the graph that Chris and Toshan showed at the beginning, uh, with the um, you know the rise in interest over time, it was just meteoric uh, at the time to come from nowhere and to have uh, I think at one point maybe it was 2015 we had to have a move the Ansible track here to a totally separate room in a part of campus that we never used because there was no room that, no single room that was big enough to hold everybody that wanted to talk about it. That's uh, that's that's saying something. Um, but from a from an approach standpoint, or why why was it so um, so popular? The um, and I think there was a the, the Salt and Ansible were kind of like these combinations of command and control systems with bits of configuration management in them, rather than traditional systems like Chef and Puppet, which are like mostly state enforcement with some uh, imperative stuff that you can do on on top of it. Um, and these, there's some error bars around these numbers too, as I think we know, like, like um, Salt has a monolithic repo for everything rather than having separate cookbook repositories. And so the numbers aren't, not, aren't strictly speaking apples to apples, but uh, I think it's, it is representative of um, the amount of interest in, these, uh, in those tools. Also at this time, uh, this is a fantastic book uh, by Justin Garrison and Chris Nova. Has, has everybody here read Cloud Native Infrastructure? This is available free. Uh, if you go to Heptio's site, you can get a free PDF download. There's two concepts that I want to pull out of this to frame uh, this generation. The first one is, you know, this term cloud native gets bandied about a lot. Um, what does it actually mean? Uh, in uh, Chris's definition, she says that um, it runs on a platform, so you interact with it programmatically. You only talk to, you only use software to talk to it, not, um, not you know, logging in and, and running commands on it directly. It's um, resilient and can handle failure gracefully. Uh, agility means that you can make changes to it quickly. It's operable. You can control the app from inside of the app, and it's observable. Cherry described this in detail this morning, but it means that you can uh, understand the workings of the system just by looking at its outputs. Second concept. Uh, Chris also makes the point that uh, infrastructure as code isn't sufficient for cloud-native applications. It doesn't represent 
how to provision the resources. It just contains a description of what the infrastructure ought to look like when it's done. So if you start thinking about your infrastructure itself as a versioned API, it talks down to lower, la lower layer APIs to get provision, and then it, pr it provides an API to higher layers to the uh, applications uh, that run on top of it. I have a little bit of quibbles with this. Like, for example, I think Ansible goes a long ways towards blending those two things because you can, in a single playbook, both provision infrastructure and then new configuration management on top of it. But having tools that purely interact with the APIs to create those underpinnings uh, was a key step in this evolutionary journey. And the result, or the, the thing that exemplifies it the most, is Terraform. Terraform represents kind of an, one of those alternate branches of evolution. It brings declarative models and a DSL, but it's really focused on the problem of provisioning infrastructure as opposed to managing it. It's very interesting because it brings sort of a similar operating model uh, that Ansible has, like the core tool is meant to run locally and it reaches out to endpoints, but it builds in the idea that those, those endpoints, the targets that you're managing, aren't systems probably, they're API endpoints. It's, uh, it is infrastructure management tool, but it meets those characteristics of cloud native infrastructure that we just talked about. And where are we today? So this is the part that people will probably want to argue about. That's fine. I'll give you a minute to take it in. Just talking through the taxonomy here. The user experience part is like what you, what you do to interact with it, and I kind of have two categories of this, uh, a raw language and a DSL. Um, there's an engine, which um, Mark Shuttleworth just talked about, um, model-driven and, and uh, what, the, what that means. I think, to me, what I, the, the, the definition of model-driven that I'm, I'm working with here is that there's some intermediate artifact in between the thing that you write and the thing that runs on the target. Right? So for example, in Terraform, you can use a plan, the plan command, you can understand what it's going to do without actually making changes. Um, if you have Puppet, the catalogs for Puppet can be generated, they can be stored, you can compare them across systems or the same system over time without ever actually making a change on a, on a system in order to, to see what it happens. And then the endpoints uh, are either uh, you know, an agent that's running on that, on that remote system that's actually making changes locally or they're meant to operate remotely. And of all the t so for all the tools that we've talked about so far, this is kind of where those, where those things lay out. For this generation, there's a couple of, th a couple of new things, new developments that I, I wanted to dig into. The first one is um, OpsMop. Has anybody here try, heard of OpsMop? Did, have you try, has anybody tried it out? Or actually download it, run it, and mess around with it? Okay, not maybe 10-ish 10, 10 people or so. Um, it's Mike DeHaan's new project. Hmm? He abandoned it yesterday. He abandoned it yesterday? Jesus Christ. Well, <laughs> there goes my talk. Uh, 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 Wow, um, I, I should have looked at the, I should have looked at the, I, I, I've been reading along with the blog posts. I, I actually thought it was really interesting. I mean, I give it, and, and I give a ton of credit to, to Mike DeHaan. As I mentioned, Ansible totally reset what we uh, expect of a tool. Uh, but he made, you know, some different choices as he was building this. I, I don't know whether the success or failure of the project overall is indicative that these are the wrong things to do. But I thought it was really interesting that he went back to, you know, a programming language rather than being pure, pure uh, YAML that he uh, ha has strong type checking and uh, explicit templating and a Python DSL, although I put an asterisk on this because uh, the, this is sort of the, the py Python interaction. And I guess this is a DSL in the sense that uh, Python is a DSL over the domain of programming. But um, it's in, um, yeah, this is how you would uh, work, work on something in OpsMop. Do I know why Mike DeHaan chose YAML in the first place? No, I don't know. But uh, I don't know. I heard from him possibly. I don't know which book. It was just he was out of time and needed something, and that was just the easiest thing. He had planned apparently to do a language for Ansible. He wanted it. Just too much overhead. So James says it was just uh, in the, purely in the interest of time to, time to get get something out the door. He used YAML. Well, kind of took over the world. I, I mean, 
We almost renamed this to YAML Camp this year, so. <laughs> All right, well, we'll keep going. Um, next up, this is a little bit of a uh, you know, full disclosure moment here. Um, I worked on this tool, and we, this is a Puppet managed project, but it is totally open source. We introduced Bolt uh, in October 2017. It's been iterating like crazy. We have uh, few, uh, like five full time developers that work on it internally. We've got a ton of uh, external contributors and pull requests. Uh, the goal was to find uh, a framework for executing tasks and plans that uh, would complement state-based management in Puppet. Um, but we wanted to make some different choices with Bolt rather than uh, throwing everything out that, that we brought over from Puppet. Uh, has anybody here tried out this tool, tried out Bolt yet? Oh, cool. It's like uh, 15, 20% maybe? That's cool. Uh, I have some stickers with our brand new logo. If you're using it, or if you download it here at camp, just, even just to try it out, let me know. I'll give you a sticker. Um, Bolt is cool because it, uh, you can start out just running commands. You can move up to running tasks, which can be written in any, any language, and have a JSON metadata description of what the task does. You can then compose those tasks together into a plan and the plan runs and can intermingle those imperative tasks with uh, Puppet code. So you can use your existing Puppet module, stuff you download from the Forge, and Bolt will compile a mini catalog that just contains the resources that you care about, ship that over to the remote system, and apply it on the remote system. So if you just want to reuse, for example, the uh, HA proxy module, um, you can do that without having to have an agent running persistently, have a puppet master set up, all that sort of stuff. You can just reuse the content and you can build a workflow around it that interacts with systems that are uh, outside of the machines that you're, you're targeting. So again, it has this kind of model of running from an end, from an end point like a, la like a laptop and uh, talking out uh, two systems that might be API endpoints, they might be network devices, they might be other, um, uh, hosts that have uh, Puppet software install them, or maybe they don't. Um, and the steps are orchestrated across different sets of servers. So, again, I'll maybe skip past this, but just to put the put those two tools in the same context uh, as the pre or the same taxonomy as the previous ones, um, kind of you get both uh, model driven and imperative stuff with Bolt. Offspot went back to a model-driven thing. It has an internal graph um, after being uh, uh, pure, pure YAML stuff. And uh, there was also both uh, agent-based and remote operating modes in both of, those, um, both of those tools. So the singularity. As I said, there might, we're not done. Things are still going. Uh, the question is, where are they going? When I did this first version of this talk, I framed it in the context of Simon Wardley's uh, Wardley maps uh, that showed the changes over time. And after this talk, I got Twitter replies from Simon Wardley, which is a little like making some comment about, hey, I'm going to go dancing tonight, and Beyonce replies to you. It's like serious business. Um, but Simon redid my map, and so this is his version of it. It just shows config management. Uh, so the way this works is the y-axis has uh, how close to the user it is, how, how, um, how visible that technology is. At the top is something that you interact with directly, and the bottom are foundational pieces that are necessary but maybe not visible. And the right axis shows the evolution through different phases of innovation uh, from brand new ideas into um, kind of the commodity or utility side. The thing I like about this is uh, Worley points out that each moving through each phase of this evolution from left to right involves innovation. Each step, like the, the work that it takes to get from something that runs on your laptop out to something that you can ship to other people and they can run on their laptops is pretty serious business. And the thing that, and the, the work that you need to do to take it from that to being something that you can, people can download and run and install themselves without having to um, read a, a, a giant document, that's, that's also requires a bunch of work. And ultimately, to get to the point where something um, is a utility, a commodity that's repeatedly used without requiring anybody to even be aware of, like um, dial tone. Does anybody remember dial tone? Maybe that's not a great example. Um, how about Wi-Fi? That's also maybe a bad example. 
um, electricity. We'll use electricity grid. That's mostly a good example. Anyways, we have a lot of, long way to go in the industry until any of our stuff works the way uh, electricity works, where you can plug into a wall outlet and expect that, that you're going to get something that works for you. Um, in Wardley's view, the parts that aren't solved, uh, like serverless is probably the newest of these, and orchestration is a little closer to the user. Um, and when we look at the cloud native computing foundation landscape, uh, there's a lot of activity going on. It's like a lot of stuff. There's uh, the, the part around automation configuration is like the little quadrant down the left, and even that's incomplete, and there's 40 things in there. I mean, it's, it's just a ton of activity. It's like a gold rush, although I'm not sure that anybody's actually getting any gold. Um, it's, not, it's not particularly clear. I'm not going to focus on the whole thing, but there are a few cloud native projects related to config management that I think are interesting and are pointed to where some unsolved project, products remain. Um, config management for Kubernetes infrastructure seems like it's an important area to work on. Uh, Lee Briggs has a great series of blog posts on his ongoing travails of getting Kubernetes-specific config management, and he's worked through a few of these tools, Case on it and Pulumi, uh, and this is Kubicorn, uh, Chris Nova, who again wrote that book. Uh, she wrote a tool out of frustration with uh, pushing uh, Terraform to be more Kubernetes aware um, and exposes a library in Go. Pulumi is interesting because it is very programming oriented. It's kind of like uses Terraform stuff, but it, you, work, you interact with it with a programming language. And Lyra, again, in full disclosure, this is a new Puppet Run project that is um, uh, all about, uh, it sort of runs as a Kubernetes operator and is able to provision both uh, stuff that's inside of Kubernetes as well as external dependencies that the system relies on. So in closing, I have a bit of a personal note. Um, I just have a few minutes left. And while I have a microphone, I just want to use this to make an important point. This is my friend Reggie. Uh, one year ago today, while I was here, Reggie took his own life back in Portland. Some of you know this because you helped me out when I got this news, and it blew my world apart. Reggie, like many of us, struggled with depression. When it overwhelmed him, he felt like he couldn't reach out to anyone. He couldn't get any help. In our industry, and in our society at large, we're conditioned to not talk about our feelings. We have this idea of hacker heroes and heroines who code for days straight, or if you're in ops, you be on call all the time and fix production at 4 a.m. and save the world. With a few notable exceptions, uh, there's still, um, we don't talk about this, and the negative consequences of burnout and the price we pay with our mental health. So please, if you feel overwhelmed, uh, Talk to somebody about it. You can talk to me if you think there's nobody else. Anytime. I don't want to lose any more friends. I love you, Reggie. Thank you. <laughs>